trying to circumvent life in a large family is also not, not, not easy. And my parents instilled in all of us the value of giving. While we were living modestly, it's not like we had the lavish things you know, of life, but that little that we had, it was instilled in us that you have to learn to share. You have to learn to give out to others. My own father taught me that um, you might think you're the worst case scenario in life, but just know that there's someone who wished they were you. All right? So there's always someone you can be in a position to help, no matter your own, own situation. I went to Migori Primary School, and from there, I passed my exams very well, and I was admitted to the Kenya High School. So I'm an alumni of Kenya High School here in Nairobi. And in that context also, I met many girls from all over, you know, the country, the girls from high to do families, but also girls from families like mine or even worse. But we gelled and we learned and we transitioned from there. So my background is in social sciences. I am currently pursuing my doctoral studies. God willing, I should graduate this year <laughs> in global public health. And I chose that path because I am passionate around community work. I'm passionate around reaching people where they are and sharing knowledge and educating them and working with them, showing them how to do things, understanding how they are doing it, appreciating how they are doing it, but then use that space to instill new knowledge, to instill better ways of doing things so that at the end of the day, everybody is, you know, successful. I am a survivor myself of gender-based violence. And through that, I got the inspiration to register and set up the Betty Adera Foundation as a way of giving back, as a way of listening from survivor perspective, as a way of opening doors for people to heal, for people to access other services, but more importantly, to engage communities, to engage men, you know, women, young people, everybody, in conversations around how to prevent all forms of gender-based violence in the first place. So to date, through the foundation, we have reached people who nobody wanted to touch. We have worked with, you know, sex workers, who are in that space not because, you know, they wish, but because life has just pushed them, you know, to that space. And we work with them to figure out alternative ways of income generation, but more importantly, ways to secure their security so that they are not violated in any way. We work a lot with persons living with disabilities because, again, that is a silent community that no one is really advocating for, you know, with, with the force that it deserves. And within the context of gender-based violence, you find that girls, you know, women who are living with disabilities are often the first ones, you know, to be violated because maybe they can't talk, they can't move, you know, they can't report, they can't communicate, depending on whatever their disabilities are. But even more importantly, the space of young girls, I am a believer that a girl who leads will be the woman president anywhere <laughs> someday. <laughs> and the way we are crafted socioculturally and sociopolitically, you find that if these leadership skills are not instilled in girls when they are young, there's some skills that might just be tough for you to start acquiring when you're 56 years old. But if we start nurturing you, you know, from the time when you're young, we instill that, 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 that skill in you, that capability in you, so that you can make use of your mouth. You have a mouth to speak, to speak up on issues that are going well, but to call out issues that need to be, need to be uh, called out. If it 
it was all up to me. I would make a law <laughs> that says the least level of education for women and girls should be form four.